I thought we could begin at the beginning. We'll hear a bit from the book later, but just wondered a bit about where your story uh, starts and whether you could share with us a bit about the beginning of your life, where you're from, and uh, perhaps a bit about your encounter with Buddhism as well. I was born in Middlesbrough uh, when it was still part of Yorkshire before some politicians shifted the borders around um, in 1948. Uh, so if you're good at maths, you'll work out that I'm 74. My father was a fitter in the shipyards. My mother left school at the age of 14 to become a scullery maid. So I have very humble origins. Um, I failed my 11 plus. I only managed to get three O levels at the first attempt and only got one A level. In fact, I have the rare distinction of being refused by my school, which was just a, an ordinary sort of... Um, council school, not in posh, they refused to enter, enter me into the general studies uh, exam for A-level because they knew I'd fail it and they wanted to save, they wanted to save the examination fee. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I'm, I'm, not an, I'm not an academic genius, as you can work out from that. Uh, I'm a total academic failure. Of course, I ended up in drama school because, you know, if you want to become an actor, you don't need any brains. Uh, so it was, it was a, a suitable profession for me, uh, which I, I, I was a working actor for about four years uh, until I encountered Buddhism indirectly, first of all, no, directly really, in Nepal in 1971 when I was trekking. And I was so impressed by the monk who looked after me and my trekking companion when we had pneumonia um, that uh, that memory stayed a very, 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 it was a very powerful experience because he had a tiny, tiny sort of quarters, really, and um, we shared those quarters with him. All night long, he'd be up performing puja. Um, he seemed to be up all day, too, and he's always so, he, he just seemed so cheerful and so deeply contented, and I knew he had something that I didn't. So when my life was in a state of crisis, a year later, I thought of that and I sought, my, sought out a Buddhist meditation teacher who eventually, uh, well, uh, and eventually found the FWBO, or Friends of the Western Buddhist Order, as we were known then, um, and got to know its founder, Sangharakshita, who became a very, very good friend. He was the first person I got to know within the movement. So that gives you uh, uh, some idea of my early days. Can you say a bit about meeting Sangharakshita? Um, <laughs> I could say quite a lot about it. I'm not sure how much I dare. I was at the Archway Centre, our centre in North, um, in North London. This was the predecessor to this centre. It was a short life property uh, which we'd rented from Camden Council. We had five years there. Uh, at the end of that five years, we had to find a new centre. Eventually, it became what is known as the London Buddhist Centre. I was waiting for, uh, it was for, a, actually it was a festival day. It was Dharma Day in July 1972. And I was waiting with everybody else for things to start. Bante came in through the door. We, ex <laughs> we caught one another's glance immediately. And um, shortly afterwards, when he'd been upstairs to the shrine room to change his robes, it changed change into his robes, when he came back down, I walked straight up to him. It was my actor's instinct. You always go to the man at the top. <laughs> and I said, I think I'm in need of spiritual guidance. Can I meet you? And he sort of looked me up and down and said, well, I haven't got my diary here with me this evening, but uh, if you'd like, like to come back um, next week, I'll sort something out. And then we met about, uh, about 10 days later. Uh, spent an entire afternoon and evening with him in his flat in Muswell Hill. And we talked about just, just about everything uh, in the universe, pretty much. A lot about Buddhism, a lot about literature, a lot about the theatre because I was still a working actor at that time. And we got on very, very well and I was really struck by his warmth and also his kindness and his remarkable erudition. I had never met anyone like him before. I never met anyone like him subsequently. Uh, he's quite unique and he had a unique quality which um, you picked up immediately. I mean, it was, it was uh, really quite <coughs> profoundly otherworldly. I can't find any other way of, of, of um, describing it, really. Uh, so I was very, very struck by him. And um, he seemed to be completely at ease with me, which he said he always, it wasn't always. A lot of people had seemingly had projections on him as the guru figure and so on and so forth. And 
He felt I was completely clear of that. He could relax in my company. He could be f just simply himself. And so that was the basis of my friendship with him. And it actually, it took me quite a while before I took him seriously as a teacher, by the way, uh, despite his erudition. I just thought he was a very, very learn learned man. Um, but he didn't show, show the necessary signs of being, being a guru. You know, in, the, in those days, we'd read all sorts of books like um, memoirs of a yogi who could perform miracles and all that sort of thing. But Bante was so, so down to earth, um, to an extraordinary degree. He was so, so, so utterly normal. He was extraordinary. He was just always just himself. And he, al he sort of, um, he was very, very mindful always. There was an atmosphere of mindfulness around him, which I, I think was quite unique. That was part of what I meant by his, his otherworldliness. I didn't think of it in those terms at the start, by the way, so that's more a later reflection. But I just knew there was something quite unique about him. And I knew that, uh, really, I would stick with him. I'd found my teacher. I had no doubts about that whatsoever, uh, with, without thinking him of him as a guru. But I knew I wanted to stay with him. And how did your friendship develop over the years? Well, we, I, I, was, well, I, he, I, I met him many, many times. and in the early days, but then he went off to Cornwall to write, or to complete rather, The Rainbow Road, uh, the first volume of his memoirs. So I didn't see, see so much of him for um, after the first six months. And he was away for a year. But then uh, I asked for ordination. Um, I went down to Cornwall to, to uh, talk to him about that. Um, it took a devil of a long time for him to make up his mind. It was six months before I was ordained which rather uh, I found very difficult to bear. You know, I was 24 at the time. You've got to bear, in bear that in mind. It seemed like a, uh, a very, very long time to wait. Um, like all young people, I was very impatient. And things haven't changed much in that regard. Look, <laughs> knowing, uh, giving, you know, I, I, I live with most of the young people upstairs. I can, I can see it, their impatience sort of oozing out of them. Well, I was probably even worse. <laughs> and that's even without Alexa on call. <laughs> You know, I couldn't. You know, <laughs> anyway, I couldn't get. I couldn't call to Alexa for ordination. No. Uh, she didn't exist then anyway, and I have no relationship with Alexa at all. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was ordained in January 1974. Very important. Very important detail. I'm sorry to have left that out. It's yeah. all right. January. It's all right. January. <laughs> it's all right. But uh, I finally was ordained, um, and almost from the very beginning of that period of when I was orda ordained, well before then actually, I'd already started teaching at the Archway Centre before I was ordained and Sabuti and I really tried to expand our activities in Archway because it, the, the centre seemed underused um, and so we set up all these classes which we were going to share the responsibility for doing but he also want to, wanted to go out and do lots of talks, get invitations from this place and that place and he's hardly ever there, and I ended up doing most of, most of the classes on my own uh, for, the, for a few months. Not, all, not entirely on my, on my own, but I, I had a huge uh, responsibility of teaching, which I just wasn't ready for, and of course I couldn't continue. Um, and I saw quite a bit of Bante during that period. Eventually I went to s uh, stay in his cottage in Norfolk uh, after he'd moved there and lived with him there for a while short while. Um, and then later on, we, mo <coughs> we, we, we got Padmaloka, the Men's Ordination Retreat Centre, that was after I just set up the, the Norwich Buddhist Centre, and I'd see him quite a lot then. Later on, I lived at Padmaloka, and late latterly with uh, at Majimaloka, I spent 18 years living there, I think maybe 16 of them with him, because he didn't, he didn't join us to start with. But I spent an awful lot of time with him, and I was part of the, or the core ordination team for men in the early days when I was a Royal Mitra convener. And so that involved me in the first ordination courses that we ran. Bante was there on those courses. I'd, I was in, he invited me on lots and lots of seminars, uh, which I attended. Um, and we just spent a lot of time together over the years. So mm. it, was a, it was not always easy with him. Um, he could be very challenging, and he was very, very particular. Um, he always liked things done in a particular way. And if you didn't quite come up to his standards, you sort of knew. Um, 
he'd let you know, he'd ask you to do it again mm. or whatever it was that he'd, you know, he, whatever mm. task he'd set you. Um, but anyway, we got to know each other very, very well. Um, and he seemed to be one of the people, I seemed to be one of the, the people that he trusted. He trusted me with some mm. pretty difficult tasks, I have to say, especially involving uh, the Croydon Centre in the early days when that started to go wrong. So I was heavily involved in really at the heart of the movement for the first 30 years of my ordination, really. Mm. Give you so some idea? It gives me some idea, yeah. You'd, um, your life changed a lot, didn't it, in your 20s? Well, it did. I mean, I was an actor. I'd always wanted to be an actor. I was disillusioned with the theatre, mm. even though I, I didn't have any problems getting work. I, mean, I was always working mm. and would go from one job to another. Yeah. In the book, it you can tell that beauty is very important to you. Right. <laughs> okay. wondered if you'd say a bit about your relationship to that. With beauty? Um, well... Speaking of the theatre and the arts. Well, that was certainly part of it, but um, I don't know. It's just something which tr it slowly emerged in my teens. I think the most striking moment for me was when... Um, I must have been about 15. Um, we read a poem, or my teacher read out a poem in an English class, and I suddenly realised there was something, there was something more to the poem than just pretty words. There was meaning to the poem, and I felt that I could grasp that meaning. I I, I knew what it meant. I knew what the poet was trying to communicate, and that was a a major sort of um, um, sort of opening up for me. I suppose, in a way, it just opened up my imagination, mm. um, and then that that. Um, um, was I felt that particularly strongly, even more so a, a couple of years later when uh, a, a different English teacher took a group of us to see um, a production of Oedipus Rex, Sophocles' Oedipus Rex at Nottingham Playhouse, which was a very, very prestigious theatre company at that, in, 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 at that time. And um, I was absolutely blown away by the performance of John Neville, who was playing Oedipus um, and the production. And it just opened up my imagination to such an extent. Uh, mm. It's not like a whole universe opened up to me. Mm. And it was a very beautiful one. It was a very, I mean, even though we're dealing with tragedy, there was a beauty to it. Mm. And I was touched by that. And at about the same time, I was beginning to listen to classical music, mm. um, which greatly irritated my parents, because, you know, music to them was Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra. Um, and um, there's a kind of slowly a, a cultural gulf was opening up between me mm. and them, which uh, we couldn't really do very much about. Um, yeah. But that's when beauty emerged in my life, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to come on to the cancer story itself, yeah. it, it has seemed to me that beauty was quite a sustaining factor in that time for you. I remember you mm. when you couldn't, it didn't have the energy to read during chemotherapy, lying mm. on your... Uh, sofa, listening to classical music. Well, even uh, even late at night when I couldn't sleep as mm. well, uh, I listened especially to Schubert at that time, and also Beethoven late, late uh, string quartets. Mm. Um, and at times I felt so deeply, profoundly moved. Mm. Um, I think it's partly because the late Beethoven's late quartets were the last things he wrote, I believe. Um, and uh, there's a particularly well, it's a wonderful sort of movement in, I can't remember which number it is, but very long uh, movement in one of the quartets, which is um, an expression of gratitude to the Almighty for after deliverance from a, a serious illness. Um, and that really, really moved me. I was, I was, very fami I was mm. familiar with it before then, but it, it had greater poignancy for me, th for mm. me then. Even and though you hadn't necessarily been delivered from no, a serious illness. I yeah. certainly hadn't been. Mm. I was in the middle of it. But mm. <laughs> uh, and Schubert, of course, he wrote a lot of his music, his late music, when he knew that he was dying. So, and I think that adds a certain beauty to the music for me, mm. and it had great appeal to me at that time. I listened to Schubert countless, mm. countless times. So just on that, I wondered uh, if we could get a little taste of the book now. Okay. Uh, I picked uh, one reading that gives a taste of your uh, aesthetic sense of the world. On Perhaps you could situate it for us as well. We had a community outing to, to Canterbury, and this is, where, this is where this starts, really, I think. Um, 
And there was a period of about 11 weeks when I wasn't certain whether my cancer had spread. Um, it was, uh, th they didn't know that for certain I had to have a, what's called a PET scan to determine that. I still didn't know, for quite a long time I didn't know where I stood, whether my cancer was going to be, well, it was terminal or whether it was just localised. So I was caught in that state of uncertainty uh, for quite a long period. And uh, so it, that, that period generated a kind of mood which I can't really adequately describe, but maybe something that comes across in the passage you've chosen. Um, uh, just, um, well, it's a, it's, it's a combination of just, um, a, because of the heightened sense of your own impermanence, it gives rise to a greater sensitivity in a number of ways, including sensitivity to beauty and atmosphere. So that, that maybe that gives you some sort of setting for, for this particular passage. So I just, I'd actually just also ha had uh, a very unpleasant side effect from um, um, one, t one test that I'd had. Despite these minor concerns, in many respects, my life had never been better. I rarely slipped into negative mental states, and even then, not for long. Many times I walked around the lake at Victoria Park in East London, appreciating its winter beauty, thrilling at the sudden flash of sunlight on a cormorant's wings, or the brilliant green of the parakeets. The subtle winter colours adorning the trees, highlighted by the sun's lateral rays. No doubt this was all heightened by my, me my medical issue, and I'm grateful to the cancer for that. It is not that this was new, but I felt it yet more vibrantly, and I have no doubt that that was due to my heightened sense of my own impermanence, precious moments that I must cherish fully, because I knew they would not, could not last. One such moment caught me unawares on a trip to Canterbury. Sitting alone, I was looking out of the train window at the rather dreary, dreary prospect as we sped by when I felt overcome by a sense of detachment from the world and its problems. They were no longer mine to sort out. I was not being grandiose. Of course, I cannot sort out the problems of the world. But somehow, they seemed not to be mine. It was not that I no longer cared. More that they seemed impersonal, beyond the purely personal. And as I continued to stare out of the window, I was blessed by a deep tranquility the perfect mood to appreciate the seat of Anglicanism. I had not been to Canterbury before and could not have imagined the impact that its wonderful cathedral would have on me. I've seen many of Europe's great churches, including plenty that are far more beautiful, but none that has affected me so powerfully. I cannot easily account for, the, for it, but I was swept away as I wandered around in awe of something I could not identify. Thank you. Mm. And in a way, we've come to the heart of the story there, uh, mm -hmm. and you uh, having cancer. So I wondered what it was like being told that you have a very aggressive cancer. Um, well, it was... Uh, it was strange, it just felt perfectly ordinary. I'd already gotten used to the idea that I had a cancer. I didn't know specifically how serious it was. I had a, I had a sense of that from um, my GP's concern when she first examined me. But um, I just took it, well, that's the reality I'm facing. And I'm going to have to deal with this. And I, and I want to deal with it positively. I have to deal with it positively. There was no other way of dealing with it, really. Which meant maintaining my positive mental states. So I just took it in. Um, in a way, I suppose, uh, what else can you do? I mean, some people seem to try to sort of close their eyes to the reality that they find themselves in, but that was never my approach. I just took it in. I can't even, I can't remember precisely what I felt. Um, I just listened to the young woman who was explaining it all to me. She said it was a serious, a serious disease, and I sort of agreed with that. 
I just thought, well, you know, you've got to deal with your, you've got to deal with this serious disease. <laughs> uh, I was still, it's, it's all right. It's quite, it was quite, amu it was quite an, an amusing interview with her actually, um, and um, uh, we just had to then wait, I think, for the the PET scan results. We still hadn't had them, mm. uh, but uh, you know, I remember her saying to me, looking me straight in the eye, and said, "You know, you this, you have a serious disease." Mm. I didn't need to be told. Mm. Um, but um, I remember it was the beginning of my treatment. Uh, I was about to start hormone therapy and I was just glad to get on with it. I knew it was a tough road ahead. I knew that almost certainly I'd be going through chemotherapy and radiotherapy as well as the hormone therapy. And that was a long journey and it was not always, <laughs> not always the most comfortable journey. But you know, what can you do? You just sort of face it. Mm. Mm. And I, 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 di I, I agreed to all the treatments because I felt that the situation was quite critical, um, as it seems it turned well as it turned out to be, um, and just trying to bring a, the most positive mind I could to it. Mm. I felt quite. I suppose I felt quite uh, equanimous to be to be quite honest. I was ready for it. You could sort of see it coming. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, when, when I saw my GP the first time, and basically what, what happened was that there was a big spurt of blood uh, one morning from my, uh, the head of my urine. And so I eventually was tested for prostate cancer. They gave me a PSA, what's called a PSA test, blood test. And um, uh, the prostate, PSA is the uh, prostate prostate prostatic specific antigen. Is that right, Lucy? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> I've been corrected. <laughs> it wasn't right. <laughs> no, seemingly not. But um, uh, I just sensed that it was serious. I knew that I had to get myself the right, in the right frame of mind. Uh, I just soaked it up. I don't know. I mean, it was... Uh, I'm not sure I can answer your question better okay. than that. What about uncertainty? Well, the uncertainty for those 11 weeks did trouble me a little bit, but not much. I mean, most people find uncertainty very difficult to deal with, and I certainly have done throughout much of my life. I mean, it was an absolute nightmare when you're an actor waiting for, you know, to hear back from someone who'd auditioned you. Um, you know, because sometimes they leave it for, for forever, and you think, oh, well, you're never going to hear from them again, and then you get the job. But the sort of intervening period when you just don't know whether you got the job or not, can be quite difficult. Um, and um, I think that the whole experience of cancer has helped me to deal with uncertainty much, much better. Mm. Um, in fact, it doesn't seem to trouble me so much anymore. Uh, I mean, I was waiting mm. for a while recently for the result of more tests, and uh, it really didn't trouble me. I was going to ask if you thought the cancer had changed you. Definitely. Mm. I think it's one of the most important experiences of my life. I mm. mean, I think that um, there are a number of key moments in my life, but this is definitely one of them. And, and it's, it's, um, it seems odd to say this, but I don't regret what's happened. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't have wished it upon myself. I wouldn't have wished it upon anybody else. But I was able to capitalize upon it, so it seemed to me, mm. uh, on the basis of having practiced the Dharma for so long. Um, the, I think one of the key turning points in my life was when I completed a nine-month solitary retreat, and I felt, not immediately, but afterwards, I felt that something significant had sh shifted after a lot of hard work over decades. But um, so that I think that helped to prepare me very, very well for the cancer diagnosis and everything which subsequently followed. Um, and. Um, so yes, when I did get the cancer, when I was diagnosed, it was, I knew that I had an opportunity to capitalize on what had gone before. Mm. Um, and I'm sure that that happened. I think it changed me. Mm. Uh, it, but, and I think it's, it's almost like having done that, that retreat, which I think um, definitely was a key turning point for me. Um, th but then that was the culmination of 45 years Dharma practice, you could say. Um, and something opened up then, and then that, that sort of opened up further with the cancer, because I brought up hard against 
my own mortality in a way that, that had never happened before. It suddenly was real. Um, but with that came this heightened awareness and a greater sense and appreciation of beauty. It's such a strange thing, mm. but other people have commented upon it also. And um, uh, it's wonderful when it happens. So I think that, that was, a, it was a, the whole experience was another turning point for me. Uh, because, well, in a way, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's uh, old age, sickness and death in your face. <laughs> it's remarkable that the, the Buddha, when, before he was enlightened at such a young age, and he might even have been a teenager when he, when he had these insights, um, he might have been much younger than the traditional 29 that's given to him. He could, he, he could even have been in his late teens because one of the very earliest, earliest texts describes him as a youth. Uh, so, you know, y if you're 29, you're no longer a youth. My apologies, 20, 29 year olds, but or even less, <laughs> you're a 29 year old. August. Oh, my condolences. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, um, it's remarkable that he saw old age, sickness and death so clearly and didn't flinch from them and knew that he had to do something about them. Uh, he knew that he was going to suffer the consequences of growing older day by day. Uh, he would get old. He becomes sick and of course he did right at, towards the end of his life mm -hmm. and he would die uh, like all of us. Uh, so um, getting a cancer diagnosis really brings that home to you big time. Um, what about fear? I mean, so, uh, there was, there were moments of fear, but they were very brief. Um, and I wasn't going to let them dominate my mind. Um, they'd come and go, but my general state of mind or frame of mind, well, it was, it was free of fear. Uh, and I think it's become freer of fear subsequently. Um, and I think having to face your own the fact of your own mortality and, and a very serious disease like cancer, one which could kill you, helps to deal with that. Well, you either, you either sink or swim with it, don't you? You either just get overcome by it, uh, and, um, which would be awful, or you learn to deal with it positively, which mainly means just allowing yourself to experience it and let, letting it go, uh, rising above and beyond it because there's always something above and beyond it. Mm. I'm interested that both hope and fear yeah. are warned against by Milarepa, a Buddhist sage you mentioned, and yeah. that the poet Shelley's got a sort of echo of that. Yes, in his case, he, he um, twins hope with despair in Epipsychidion, in his long poem. Mm. Saying um, that they're both torturers. That's right. So why is hope a torturer as well as despair? And fear, of course. Um, well, because it's, uh, it's a torture because usually if you're hoping for something, you're hoping that, well, you either want one, you want one experience and, you d and there's another experience that you hope you don't have. But very often what we get is the experience that we don't want. Um, that's why it's a torturer. Um, because um, I think it's best to live without hopes. I don't mean live without hope. You see what I mean? There's a distinction to be made there. But um, to indulge in hopes is only going to lead to trouble because your hopes are very, very rarely realised. Um, uh, or if they are realised, not in the way that you might have wished them to be. So I try, uh, I mean, ever since really reflecting on um, Milarepa in my nine-month retreat, I read Milarepa every day, and I, I noticed this frequent occurrence, warning his disciples against hope and fear. So I, I reflected a lot on that and and really tried to eschew any hope um, of that kind in my life. Because I could see, well, yes, it would lead to fear. Um, and uh, so, again, with the cancer diagnosis, uh, I, was aware, I was wary of hopes. And I didn't want other people to hope for me. Mm. Um, I wanted to be free of hope. I wanted to be free of other people's hopes. Mm. I didn't mean to be unkind, because often people were, were wishing me well. And that was very, very, it was sincerely meant. And... Um, uh, I took it in that spirit, but mm. I didn't take it all that seriously. Mm. You know, okay, well, you know, I remember someone saying, and I commented on about this in the book, that um, when he found out that my cancer had uh, spread, it, it, had, it had gotten slightly beyond the prostate. In other words, I had two infected lymph nodes, 
um, and he'd had, he'd had prostate cancer himself. And he, s and he wrote an email to me later saying, uh, oh, didn't know about the lymph nodes, fingers crossed. And I thought, you know, I mean, that's a symbol of hope, isn't it? I thought, no, I don't want that. Mm. I'll deal with what comes to me. Mm. Uh, I'm prepared for it. I don't want to dodge it. Mm. And we spend too much of our time in life trying to dodge what we don't want. Mm. Um, you can't always do that. Uh, you certainly can't dodge the disease that's coming your way. Mm. Let's come on to people's responses okay. uh, a little later because that, that's interesting. Okay. But uh, if you're happy to give us another reading, okay, yeah. there's another bit I've picked that invokes the heroism, including of the Buddha. As there was no longer a even a theoretical doubt that I had cancer, I wanted more of my friends to know, and I decided to email some of them. The responses I received, as you would expect, were all concerned and sympathetic, but in some cases there was an element of anxiety. Not mine, but theirs. And this could be quite difficult. They seemed to need to talk about it in a way that I did not. I simply, wa simply wanted them to know and would have preferred to leave it at that, as I did not want cancer or talking about it to dominate my life more than was absolutely necessary. Naively, it had not occurred to me that some of them might need to talk with me about it more than I cared to do so. Occasionally, I find myself in the anomalous position of having to reassure them about cancer, <laughs> as if I was helping them to deal with their own fears. If one of my friends was anxious, I could react to their anxiety with my own. Negative emotions can be contagious. When this first happened, I was rather thrown and asked myself, why had I suddenly become anxious? As I reflected, it became clear that it was not my anxiety, but theirs, and I needed to respond with positive emotion, patience, sympathy, or perhaps even compassion. From a Buddhist point of view, these positive emotions are all simply manifestations varying in tone according to context of the fundamental Buddhist virtue of metta, or universal loving kindliness. Something similar happened when I received a letter from my GP's surgery, inviting me to make an appointment to talk about my care plan. The letter began with an expression of regret at the news of my serious diagnosis. Suddenly, there was a butterfly in my stomach. I have never been a violent man, but, uh, but I am at ease with the more forceful elements inherent in manhood and value them. Consequently, consistent with my aggressive character, I gave this flutterer the short shrift it deserved. Damn it! Leave me alone! And it left me in peace. Such an approach may not work for everyone, but I've always been attracted by the heroic dimension of the Buddha's character and teaching, and have sought to emulate it. I crumpled the letter and cast it away as if it were contagion. Although well intended and clearly meant to be supportive, such comments can be counterproductive. Fundamentally, I felt upbeat about my diagnosis. I regarded it as a challenge, not one that I would have chosen, but since it was there, all I could do was meet it with the heroic spirit underlying the, the entire Buddhist tradition that was stirring within me. I must embrace it even enjoy it for what it was. However, to do that, I needed all the positive emotion that I could muster. Okay. You say uh, at another point in the book mm -hmm. that equilibrium of the mind is more important <laughs> than life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I do indeed say that, and I believe it actually. Um, what do, you, what do you mean? What do I mean by that? Um, Someone well might think being alive is the most important thing, mm. you know, and maybe I don't have a mind if I'm not alive, so <laughs> yeah. how could mental equilibrium be more important yeah. than life? Well, I suppose in the, in the grander scheme of things, Buddhism, Buddhism, of course, teaches about consciousness, and that consciousness is um, not, it's not something which is permanently trapped in a particular body. 
it's something which um, is, well, we, 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 we at the point of death it's said that consciousness detaches itself from the body. And it's particularly important, so it is said, to be in a positive frame of mind at the point of death. In other words, when the consciousness is separating itself from the body and going into what in Tibetan tradition is known as the bardo. Um, so uh, that's something that I have reflected upon a lot, especially since uh, the diagnosis, the cancer diagnosis. Um, I feel it's really important that whenever I die, in whatever circumstances, from whatever cause, I want to be in a positive frame of mind. I want to be in a state of equanimity, uh, just to sort of uh, get through that phase, if you see what, I'm, uh, see what I mean. But actually, I think that equanimity is the key, really, um, to the whole Buddhist life. Um, this, uh, there's a famous verse somewhere in the Sutra Nipata where someone asks the Buddha, well, how do you deal with, with pain and, st and, and, and illness? And he, he makes it quite clear, you deal with it with equanimity. Uh, you don't push it away, uh, you just let it in, experience it. Uh, and so, of course, it's been on my mind that um, if I, if in the, as a consequence of the cancer, um, the cancer should metastasize, it has just done that, by the way. Um, I would then be in a position of, um, well, it, I can't be cured anymore. So what's going to happen at the end? Because cancer deaths uh, can be very, very painful. Uh, and usually people are completely drugged out of their minds with morphine. Um, and I really don't want that to happen to me. So... War, or like, and that's a huge challenge, of course, for anybody. So you have to learn, presumably, at some point, and this is, the, this is the challenge that lies ahead of me, potentially, learn to deal with that intense pain, that sustained intense pain, um, with a mind of equanimity. That indicates to me why, yeah, well, that, that may explain, rather, why I said what I said. Mm. Because the particular context in which I said that, it was partly a bit of a quip to somebody else who had cancer, another order member who... Ah unfortunately passed away uh, not, not long after. It's the, most th it's the most important thing to hold on to, is that equanimity of mind. To do that truly, you need to be in a, cl you need a, a clear and bright mind. And you do not have a clear and bright mind if you're, you know, I if you're taking morphine. So I'm not quite sure what will happen. I mean... Um, Although you, know, you have said, I want to die alone outdoors yeah. in contact with nature that's that would be my preference right mm -hmm. why alone because i think i could relax into it more um and i think it's probably partly because my father died of chronic heart disease um in teesside general hospital uh, when i was in my mid to late 40s watching him die was I mean, watching anyone die is painful, but watching someone die in hospital is doubly so. Um, and I swore that I would not die in a hospital. Uh, at least I made a resolve to try and avoid that if I possibly could. Uh, my mother also died in hospital, and that sort of um, um, made that a firmer resolve, if you see what I mean. And so I've, I've thought quite a lot about death since my diagnosis. How could mm. I not? Um, uh, because for a while, as, as I said, I didn't know whether the cancer had spread even though it's now beginning to spread. Um, and um, it just seemed to me that was the obvious, obvious thing to do. I mean, how can you relax in a hospital environment? I mean, it, it seems to me completely... Um, I can't imagine it, it's possible. Well, the Bante died in hospital. Uh, but then he was only there for a day and a half before he died. Um, maybe that makes it easier. But um, the idea of dying alone in some beautiful place has great appeal to me. And um, the details of that, <coughs> I'm not going to comment on. Mm. Mm -hmm. And what do you think happens after that? After death? Well, I mean, I can only, I can only cite the tradition. I mean, <laughs> I've got no recollection of a previous life. I've got no recollection of a previous death. Well, I might have, I suppose. Um, well, I had a recurring dream when I was very, very, well, a recurring nightmare when I was very, very young. And I often wondered whether it was um, a hangover from a, my final end. I mean, it was the same dream. I, I don't know. It happened countless times when I was two, three, four years old until one day it just stopped. And um, 
you know, it was very particular. It was like wandering over sand dunes. I mean, not like sand dunes at the seaside, uh, but real sand dunes in a big desert. And I did wonder what if that was something that had, that had come with me from a previous life. But anyway, that's pure uh, speculation. I may mean, have nothing to do with that wh whatsoever, but uh, I have no recollection of a previous life or death. But um, what comes next? Well, it's the great unknown, isn't it? It's also the great adventure. Um, it's quite exciting in a way when you, s when you really start to think of it. Um, especially at my stage of life, you know, because my body's been hammered by cancer treatment. Um, you know, I was, a vigorous, uh, I was a vigorous man in late middle age before the cancer hit me or before I started chemotherapy, uh, etc. Uh, as you know... I you used to run into you at the swimming pool. Exactly. And I could swim faster than you could. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's all gone completely. The body is, is beginning to sort of give way. I've got contractures in my hands, which eventually might mean I won't be able to unbend my fingers. That's not much fun to look forward to. Um, so, you know, what else? I've got all sorts of ailments like that, uh, hangovers from chemotherapy, radiotherapy even. And so, you know, when you've had those experiences behind you, the, the prospect of getting a new body becomes very appealing. Ah. The only way to get a new body is to get rid of the old one. <laughs> the only way to get rid of the old one is to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, Which, of course, I argue. will yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it might be sooner, it might be later, mm. we don't know. I mean, even with uh, the, mm. the, the metastasis of my cancer, I can, uh, you know, I might live you know, another seven or eight years mm. with radiotherapy. Mm. Uh, I might live longer than that, because you know, these are just averages they give you. And before that, yes, you're to become a ghost. Yes, I'm already. I already am one. <laughs> Expand on that a little. Franny Manus is referring to a, an incident that I recount in my book, and there's a follow-up to it as well. But I was, I was party to conversation just after I'd been diagnosed, actually, by my GP, tentatively diagnosed. I knew she was convinced that it was prostate cancer, that I had a, I had a serious cancer. And I was being driven to a retreat by. I can't remember, Sinha Manus might have been there. Brian was there, actually. Um, and um, uh, there's Ruta and I can't remember who else. So it was five of us, I think, in the LBC car on the way to Vajrasana. And I was completely sort of uh, in my own world thinking, where could I go and die? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thinking about, you know, what the, you know, northwestern Scotland, on the coast somewhere, uh, perhaps. And... Um, Completely lost in this reverie, then I was suddenly asked a question. I, can't, I think it was Sin, um, Singham Manus who asked me the question. He um, said, so well, what about older order members, Dave Mitra? I hadn't a clue what they'd been talking about, so I just said the first thing that came into, into my mind was, was uh, they must learn to become like ghosts. And I don't know where it came from. It, they were startled that I said that. I, I was startled myself. <laughs> but, but, you know, it obviously just welled up from somewhere, <laughs> from the depths of my unconscious. And I sort of think, well, you know, maybe I should give that serious consideration. What did that mean? Or what could that mean? And um, it had a meaning for me, let's say. I suddenly realised that I needed to sort of pull back away from the world in a certain sense to let others, you know, come through and move forward. Uh, I'd had my time as a leader in the movement. I'd had my time being at the heart of things and so on and so forth. I need to take a step backwards um, to be a, a bit detached from the world in a way that a ghost would be, mm. something along those lines. Mm. And I rather liked that idea and I thought more and more about it and uh, I tried to practice being a ghost in that sense, uh, on retreats especially. Um, just sit and hang around in the corners, <laughs> <laughs> the hidden corners, and talk to whoever sort of might approach me and sit next to me. Um, I d I've done that countless times on the winter retreat. At, well, not countless times, but every time I've done on the winter retreat at Adistana. Um, I've yeah. seen you ghost around the LBC as well, not long after you moved into the community and you had very serious back pain. Oh, yes. You'd come down before the class, mm -hmm. chat to people, mill around, connect. Everyone would go into shrine rooms, you'd trudge back up the stairs, lie on your back and read Robertson Davies novels. <laughs> Come yeah. back down the stairs for the tea break, <laughs> mill, 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 chat, chat, chat. <laughs> They'd go back to shrine rooms. You'd go back up the stairs, lie on your back, read Rolls and Davies, and then you'd go back down for the end of the class, wouldn't you? Right, just I did. To, just to I see people. I did indeed. Yeah. And so the ghosts sort of 
just appears and just disappears. <laughs> <laughs> you look around the shrine room, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we finish with one last reading? Okay. Now that I was evidently looking well, several people told me how dreadful I had looked, <laughs> especially towards the end of my treatment. One of my friends had even thought that I was not going to survive it though others seemed to think I was much worse than I ever felt. A dead man walking, as one had put it to me. It is easy for me to forget that the precarious state of my health affects not just me, but also my friends, one of whom told me he felt sad that he might lose me. I was very touched, yet he might not, at least not from the cancer. I'm in such a paradoxical position. I might be completely cured or dead from the cancer in a year or two. If I'm cured, I'm unlikely ever to know. But I will certainly know eventually if I'm not. Damocles' sword will dangle above my head by an ever fraying thread for my remaining days. But should I look up, which most of us rarely do, would I see anything other than a harmless spider? Yet there's a deeper paradox. Before cancer, I was happy. During diagnosis and treatment, I was no less so. And I remain so, despite the greater uncertainty of my life and the discomforts and inconveniences cancer has brought. Indeed, I'm probably happier than I have ever been. I was teaching regularly again, having just begun a six-week introductory course on Buddhism and meditation. Nothing makes me happier than communicating the Dharma. Thank you. That seems a good place to stop. So thank Great. you very much, Dev Mitra. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much for sharing like I said earlier, something of your mind with us and actually for taking all the trouble to write the book, which I think is a real gift to people. It's a lovely uh, read. Um, it's like being in Dave Mitra's company. It's uh, witty and warm and um, interesting, I think. And um, I'm really, really pleased that you wrote it. Um, and thank you for, well, being completely relaxed and open about even what's happening now um, and looking back over some of the some of those years. But uh, yeah, thank you very, very much again for yeah, sharing yourself so frankly. Uh, Dave Mitra, thank you. Thank you.